through all of that, I have to journey back to when you very, very casually said, if you've ever had a gun pointed at you. It's happened a few times, actually, but it happened in Yemen when I was going to Yemen years, years ago on an assignment for National Geographic to document the frankincense trail. Everyone in Yemen, every male, has at least two weapons, either an AK-47 or a Kalashnikov and a great big knife called Jalaba. If you lead an interesting life, good pictures will happen. Oh, nice. You might well be my sexiest sounding guest. Go somewhere you've never been before and take a camera. We had this gorgeous Mediterranean light just flowing in. Which as do we win? A Dartford. Very nice. Your first 10,000 pictures are your worst. Let's sit down. Let's have a cup of tea. Welcome to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to another episode of the Standout Photography Show with me, Matthew Walker, where, as always, it is my honour and privilege to interview the finest working photographers in the world to unpack their systems, workflows, and find out what enables them to perform consistently at the very top of their profession. On today's show, I welcome back the wonderful Mr. Martin Hartley. That is at Martin R. Hartley on Instagram and martinhartley.com on the World Wide Webs. That is Hartley with an A. H-A-R-T-L-E-Y. Martin is a travel, adventure and expedition photographer working in some of the most challenging environments on the planet. He has spent more than 400 days working in the Arctic and Antarctic on more than 20 polar expeditions and assignments. If you've not listened to last week's episode, here is a brief recap. Anyway, so I came back from that expedition. It was a sponsored expedition by Motorola. They paid for the expedition and they paid for my expenses and for my film and my processing. Um, Fuji gave me a lot of film as well. And I came back from that expedition and realised that as a photographer, if you can organise an expedition and get a corporate sponsor to pay for it in exchange for photographs, that would be a great ticket to do travel photography and expedition photography and make some money from it as well. So myself and Paul Deegan did a lot of expeditions together. He would write and I would take pictures and would sell the pictures afterwards or get a corporate sponsor to pay for them. So that's how I started off in the expedition photography world in 1999. If I hadn't met Paul Deegan, I would probably be still in London doing special effects photography using Photoshop and digital tools. That was Martin on last week's episode. Right now, you are about to listen to part two of two, where we pick up discussing Martin's workflows. We also discuss career visualisation, empathy in photography, overcoming fear, getting the best from portrait subjects, making mistakes, finding confidence, captioning your work, which Martin tells the most incredible story at the very end of the episode to highlight the importance of learning how to caption your work and the age-old discussion digital versus film. So without further ado, please enjoy part two of my conversation with the wonderful Mr. Martin Hartley. What does your journey look like from the moment you take the memory card out of the camera to delivering the final image okay so I, i'm not my workflow is pretty inefficient but it's i've made the mistake and it is a mistake or when aperture first came out i got used to working in aperture the old apple software yes i knew the one yeah got used to working with that and then realized i couldn't because i don't have photoshop on my computer because it's just such a massive beta program i do not want to even start learning it because my, my time at my computer will just balloon if I do that. Mm. And having having got having spent seven years in a colour dark room learning about colour balance and contrast and tone control and dodging and burning, I, th I thought Lightroom does everything I really wanted to do because I don't want my photographs to look like something from Harry Potter. Um, so I import my cards into Aperture. I, do, I edit them in Aperture in, in terms of yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Get all the yeses from Aperture, export the originals into a folder on my computer, on my hard drive, and then I import those originals 
into a light into Lightroom and then adjust the curves and the tone and the saturation and those kind of things and then export those files to TIFFs for printing. Ah, I see. I have tried doing it all in Lightroom because it is clunky having two programs to do what that can do the same job, but I just can't get used to Lightroom as a a kind of the way that Apple, uh, sorry, Aperture is for selecting images I want to keep. I prefer that interface to the one that Lightroom has. I think it's interesting as well because it's really, really important to know the programs that you are using and be comfortable with them. You could spend a million hours learning Photoshop, but if you have a system that works for you, clunky or not, if it works, then you should run with it. Mm. I suppose well, that's it, really to know, because that's... Well, I, I think it's just interesting because I think from... And I, I could be wrong for anyone listening, so my apologies. For amateur photographers, I think they're is a danger to go out and spend thousands upon thousands of pounds buying the best equipment, whereas sometimes actually the best shots come from what you said earlier. It's not the camera, it's not the equipment, it's not the software, it's you. And it's your outlook and your perspective to get good images. May we move on to talk about the Black Sea map? Mm. Because, again, I'll put a link in the show notes for anyone to go to your website and look at it. It looks absolutely incredible, and I don't even know where you would start to work on a job like that. First of all, can you tell us what your job was on that Black Sea map? Yeah, so Black Sea map, MAPS is an acronym for Maritime Archaeology Project. Um, so I did it on two separate expeditions, um, had uh, twofold, two programs running at the same time, which was to drill holes into this Black Sea seabed and pull out six metre length cores of the seabed so they could analyse what the climate was like 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years ago, depending on where they took the sample from. And the ship was equipped with these scanning devices, these robots that went underwater and scanned the seabed to see beneath. And in doing that, they discovered shipwrecks. So they would make a note of the positions of these shipwrecks on their on their um, their transect and then on their return back when the ship turned around to go back it would go and look um, at investigate stop the ship and go down and send these submersibles down to look at these shipwrecks um, so that was the job I my job was the easiest photography assignment I've ever had <laughs> and this is the one where you had to rush the ta- this yeah. is the taxi story, oh, yes. yes. That's the one. I did make it in the end. I did, I did make it onto the ship. Um, yeah, it's, I was just walking around, swanning around the ship, wearing shorts and a T-shirt with my one camera and my two lenses, <laughs> documenting the scientists doing their work. And on the ship, every single person, without exception, whether a cleaner or a chef, or worked in the laundry in the ship, or they were a scientist, or a computer programmer, or the captain of the ship, or um, one of the engineers of the robots, or the ship's mechanic, they all absolutely loved what they did. And they loved the project. That adds a massive source of inspiration as a photographer, because you're surrounded by people who love what they do. Whatever that is they're doing, they just love doing it and where they are. That makes a massive difference when you're with people, if they love what they're doing. Um, So that had a really powerful effect on me. I wanted to do the best job I could. So actually, in all seriousness, going to bed was a real inconvenience (laughs) because they were working on 24-hour rotations. So there was always something going on on the ship, 24 hours a day. And for me to go to bed with the thought of missing out on stuff that's happening was a real pain. So I didn't really get much sleep, maybe five hours a night or something like that, six maximum if I was lucky, sometimes three. Sometimes I'd stay up for 24 hours because there was things happening and it was just exhaustion that sent me to sleep. So I could go to sleep. I was a, 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 you know, master and commander of my own project on the ship. I could do what I wanted, when I wanted to do it or not so 
I didn't have a normal working day, as it were, but I didn't mind that. As a photographer, how does a job like that come across your desk? Because it's not your average corporate headshot or commercial shoot. How does something like that arrive? Oh, my God. This is, this is where photography and serendipity overlap a lot with the stuff I do. So I did a job for um, Walking with the Wounded a few years ago, photographing some wounded veterans in Norway. And one of the guys that was organising that logistical programme, and it was a Prince Harry South Pole expedition, and he left that project to go and work on the logistics for this Black Sea map, this maritime archaeology project. He's, he's a logistics person. And he recommended me, as a photographer, to go onto this ship. So he left his job with walking with the wounded to go and do the logistics for the Maritime Archaeology Project. Um, so because I met him in Norway, somehow <laughs> he sends me off to Bulgaria to go jump on a ship. And that happens a lot in, in my work. It's, sometimes I have to really, really, really um, pinch myself. Um, another good example, sorry, I'm going on a bit now. Uh, That's okay. Another good example is... Without getting too spiritual, um, this if you th- if you really think something and you really want something to happen, somehow your subconscious jumps into the driving seat and takes you to places to make things happen. Mm. So, the best example of that I've got is I used to have a map on my kitchen wall with places I've been. Not as anything show you off, I just forget where I've been. So I used to put pins in the map. And I stood at the front of the map one day, and I looked at the most northerly piece of land in Russia called uh, the little peninsula of land called Severnia Zemlya, which is a little snake of land that goes up into the Arctic Ocean. And I looked at it, and I put, put my finger on the map, and I thought, I wonder what it looks like there. And then I started working out ways to get there. And then I couldn't find it anywhere any mechanism to get to that point on the map. And then I was introduced to a guy after a talk at the Royal Geographic Society um, called Ben Saunders. Ben Saunders was planning an expedition to cross the Arctic Ocean from that point of land on the map to the North Pole and across to Canada. And he said, would I... So I had a beer with him had a chat and he said well if we get the funds together will you come with me <laughs> he didn't know i'd had my finger on a map a few months previously saying i want to go there i want to see what it looks like from the ground on that point and then miraculously in 2004 i'm standing on that point on the map where i have my finger how amazing is that that happens a lot i think it's really powerful and i spoke to chris weston who is a wonderful wildlife photographer and he said something very similar when he started his journey as a wildlife photographer he said i imagined i was one he said i wasn't but i imagined i was i got business cards and i i thought like a wildlife photographer and he said it was so powerful because it guided him on his path i think it's very very important yeah, it is. And sorry, someone I, I should really mention uh, another key influence in determining what I've done for the last 20, for my entire adult life. I went, um, <laughs> so Paul Deegan again, I said I want to work for National Geographic. And he said, you should go and speak to Nigel Windsor at the Royal Geographic Society. Um, which at the time, I was, was 17? No, no, that's a lie. I was uh, 20, 27 or something. Uh, something I can't remember. 25, 26, 27. Anyway, um, so I went to see my friend Shane Windsor at the Royal Geographic Society and said, I want to meet Nigel and show him my photographs from the Eastern Premiers because I want to, I want to work for National Geographic. And she said, well, he's, he's next door. Go and see him. So I walk into this, his office with, you know, um, Deputy Director of the Royal Geographic Society, quite scared because he's a big man. He's a big, charismatic, lovely, lovely bloke. 
um, said, I want to work for National Geographic. I want to be an expedition photographer. And he said, well, get your work published and then come back and show me. Which was some of the best advice I'd ever heard. I didn't know how to get work published. Didn't know how to go and see. But eventually I sort of wormed my way through to see picture editors and magazine editors and got some of that work published. And that ball never stops rolling, Touchwood. You've got an incredible body of work behind you. How do you whittle all of that down to the 50, 60 images, however many are on your website, that now advertise your work? Oh, my God. I'm, it is an ongoing fight. Um, I just I haven't really noticed until the last few years. Literally haven't noticed because I've been going and doing and going and doing. And then putting those images onto the website, I could take them all off and put another set on. I take them all off and put another set on and keep going. Uh, so it is, it is impossible and it's a brain-frying task. I'm not really capable of doing it, I don't think, because I've seen a lot of the images over and over and over again. And, of course, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a bit like when you hear a piece of music and you think, oh, my God, I love that track, and then you play it to death. And then you can't actually hear it. Do you know what I mean? It's the same I, I do. I know exactly what you mean. Same pictures. I think, oh, my board of seeing that picture. And, it, you know, that top of the world picture, I can't, I've got it on my living room wall because it's just, it's a mistake to keep it exp- myself exposed to it. So, and I shouldn't say it's my work. I shouldn't. But the truth is, I'm actually bored of seeing it. Even though I'm very proud of it and it's a, photograph um, that I'm very proud of. And my favourite picture, I don't have on my wall because I don't want to see it because I want to keep it beautiful, sort of safe or locked in or whatever the phrase is. Yeah, I was smiling because I know exactly what you mean. I have taken images in the past which I have loved and you look at the back of the camera and then you edit it and go, wow, that is that is a printer. And then you look at it all of the time and then there's a point where you've looked at it so much that you start to think, is that even a good photo? And I'm not saying that your uh, your oh, top absolutely. of the world photo isn't, but I know exactly the feeling you mean. But up, um, um, on the opposite side of that coin is I've got a couple of prints on my wall of, of Tom Stoddart, who I should put in touch with. He's one of my favourite conflict photographers. And I look at his prints every day and never get bored of them. Just, I just admire them the whole time. Yes, I do. He is a wonderful, wonderful photographer. And fingers crossed, with your connection, we might be able to get him on the show. I'm sure listeners would be delighted he's to hear from him. He's a humble man. He's, and, it, you know, I think I've been through stuff. Looking at his work, I just haven't even scratched the surface of a social value, shall we say, in terms of photography. It's interesting that you say he's very humble, because it's one of the things I've been constantly searching throughout these interviews to find the recipe for success as photographers and the people that you speak to that have the highest profile yourself art timothy allen tom they you're very open and as soon as i've approached you you've just said yes i'd love to when can we speak and it's really refreshing and i think it's one of the things that makes you all very very successful in your chosen careers that you're very open to new ideas. Yeah, I've had this thought recently um, because a, a really good friend of mine, um, she's called, I'll put you in touch with her as well, she's called Anna Maria Pavalaki. She, I came across her at the Royal, Geographic, the Royal Geographic Society a few years ago. She gave a talk as a photographer and a researcher. She'd gone away to Tajikistan to document a group of women that were setting up a research program to as a, as a conservation effort for snow leopards, which that part of the world, women being in control of that kind of operation, is unheard of because it's a Muslim country and that's the kind of thing that the men would do. But she was there documenting women doing this. And her photographs were absolutely beautiful. And I didn't know they were her photographs 
and she gave a talk. She stood up at the stage at the Royal Geographic Society at Explore Weekend, and I went. To, I made a point of going up to her afterwards and saying, "I just want to check. Were they your photographs? You were you showing us?" And she said, "Yes." And I said, "I've never seen such beautiful photographs of that part of the world taken as a, someone who, who's a writer and a researcher. They were just. They were just." completely out of this world and I passed on a job to her to go to Oman to photograph an Outward Bound project earlier this year because there was, I was offered the job but I was thinking I'm not the right person for this job as much as I'd love to do it I know someone who could do this job better so I passed it on to Anna Maria and she did an amazing job and she asked me if I'd write something about her work for her new website so she's in transition from from her current job to becoming a full-time documentary photographer. And I've been sort of hoping, I'm hoping I'm helping her, I've helped her on her way to do that. And I was thinking, what is it about her work that makes her different from other photographers' work who do similar things? Mm. And it occurred to me, you just mentioned it then, with talking about Tom and Tim Allen and other, other photographers. Um, it's, I think, Good photographers, no matter if they're fashion photographers or um, wildlife photographers or portrait photographers or travel photographers, I think the best photographers, because you're interacting with human beings the whole time, if you're not an empath, you're not going to get past the front door, are you? Because you have to get the best out of people all the time. And to do that, you have to be a natural empath if you're a bully or a show off or an ego maniac you're not going to get very far with people and getting into places into meetings into rooms into people's homes you're just not going to do that mm. so i think that is what separates the best photographers from from the good ones is them having a and you know being empathetic towards other people it's certainly been hands down one of the most constant themes of speaking to all of you and it's been incredibly refreshing when you hear you all say it it really is i'm pleased that you mentioned portrait photography because you are also a very very exceptional portrait photographer and you've taken some incredible portraits of uh, ranoff fines ben fogel sean conway who i had the pleasure of interviewing last year lovely man huh? <laughs> We'll, we'll come on to that a bit later on. Really lovely man. What for you makes a good portrait photograph? Well, I'll just let you in on a secret that I've never really fessed up to before, but I was terrified of portraiture. I used to assist portrait photographers when I was in London. Didn't dare engage in portrait photography because it's quite a scary thing to to be faced with a person, mm. uh, the picture. So I shied away from it for years, and then I thought, actually, there's... I'm getting old now, so I want to stay. I want to sleep in my own bed more often than sleeping outside, and I want to have a. I don't want to go to an outside toilet for the whole rest of my life. <laughs> you know, have a warm Lucy, things like that. So I thought, portrait photographer, I just have to tackle this beast of fear of being shy with with people. And portrait photography has you have to. You can't be shy and be a portrait photographer. You can't. You have to. You have to give something of you to them to get something back. And what and that's been a process of me learning how to take portraits. And it's, you know, it's, if you are interested in someone, or, you know, genuinely interested in someone, you can get something back from them. And that's where the mechanism between photographer and subject sort of knits together. That's when you get part of their personality coming out in the picture. If you can't look at a photograph of a complete stranger and understand a bit about their character by not having met them, then it's not a portrait photograph, it's a snap. That is what, for me, is a good portrait photograph. You mentioned it then. Have you ever found yourself in a position where someone didn't feel comfortable being photographed in that fashion? And if so, how did you work with them to put them at ease and get the best out of them? I'm sure you've heard this a million times. Oh, I hate having a picture taken. Yes. I'd rather go to the dentist and have my picture taken. Yes. Things like that. I think, I think a lot of photographers will probably resonate with that. Yes. So the trick is, when I meet someone, and you can pick whether they say it or not, 
you can tell they don't like having a camera lens pointed at them. And if ever you've had a gun pointed at you, you'll know how it is for people who are fr afraid of photography to have a camera lens pointed at you. It's quite offensive to have someone point something at you, whether it's a finger or a gun or a lens. So what you have to do then as a human being is be an empath, is leave the camera down or just have it. If I'm with someone, if I'm in, in the street, if I'm a street doing street photography, I'll keep my camera out so people can see it. So it's here around my neck, on my chest, big lens, big camera, massive piece of metal start talking to them they can see you have a camera on your person if you talk with them first and just talk about anything then you have you can engage with them as a human being and they can see you're not offensive or you're funny or you're friendly or you're just gentle they'll let their guard down a little bit and you sort of without them realizing you sort of creep into their personal space at least with your intentions shall we say hmm. and then when they realize you're not a threat then their guards sort of slip down but that's if you're trying to take a street portrait for example but if you have phoned someone up or sent them an email please can I take your portrait they're already expecting you to do that even though they may not like it, they're expecting it. So you still have to break those barriers down um, a little bit. To you have to be interested in them, and sh you know, once you're interested in them, they will feel you're interested in them, and then they will relax a little bit. It is excellent advice, but through all of that, I have to journey back to when you very, very casually said, "If you've ever had a gun pointed at you." Have you ever had a gun pointed at you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you said it so casually. I, I have to ask, when and why? <laughs> it's, it's happened a few times, actually. But um, the first time was when I was, I just left school and I was interrailing and I was sleeping on the floor of a train station in Italy. And I was woken up by, some, by a, a rather belligerent Italian policeman with the barrel of his gun and I was sleeping on the station opened my eyes and he's literally got the barrel of the gun pressed against my head just gently tapping it speaking in Italian obviously I shouldn't have been there that was pretty scary um, and it happened in Yemen when I was going to Yemen years, years ago on an assignment for National Geographic to document the frankincense trail and everyone in Yemen every male has at least two weapons either an AK-47 or a Kalashnikov and a great big knife called Jalabra. They're just there for show, like some guys around here just drive big fancy mercedes Benzes just for show. <laughs> uh, they have guns for show. And there is, a, there is I mean, uh, there is a lot of terrorists living in Yemen, so you have to be nice to people when they're pointing guns at you. I went into one cafe in Yemen and never had one pointed at me with, with intent for someone to blow my head off. Touch wood, not yet. This is why I was really, really looking forward to our conversation today. I didn't expect it to go in that direction, but this is exactly why I was thrilled. <laughs> what will you... You're clearly at a point in your career now where you've achieved so much. What will you say no to that allows you to focus on your career? My God, that's a good question. That's a very timely question. Um, so I don't I have this huge mental block in me I just I go about my day to day life and work as just me scratching his way through life as a photographer I don't really I don't have any any concept of what I've achieved particularly um, I don't see myself as a established photographer particularly i just in my group of my sphere i just all my friends do these amazing things um and it's just it's it's i want to say horrible it's difficult sometimes being surrounded by all these super achievers that are, happen to be friends of mine and i 
don't see myself fitting in. It's a psychological anomaly, really, I suppose. I don't really, I just, little old me is how I see myself. I don't really have any vision of a, I don't know what people see when they look at my work. I really don't, I really don't. I wish I did. I wish I could step outside myself and look at my work without having prior knowledge of it. So I don't, it's really difficult for me to see myself in in that way it's it's a it's a quite a it's quite a barrier for my progression i suppose as a photographer so i don't really know what the next thing is except the expedition i mentioned at the start mm. a sense of purpose for me to go and document that ice now before it's gone i see that i don't i see that as i don't have a choice i have to go and photograph it because i can and it's important to do that that is the next thing that's the only one thing that's driving me at the moment is making sure I get that expedition together somehow to go and photograph the ice. That's the only thing I can think of. And then beyond that, I don't think I could contribute something as big as that in my entire life again as a photographer. What's the best mistake you've ever made as a photographer? And I don't mean that in a negative way because a few people have said that. Oh, have taken it negatively and I mean it in a positive way. I'm a huge fan of mistakes. I'm self-taught and that's the way I like to learn. So I like mistakes. Is there one that stands out for you that has really defined the way you work? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, mistake, you, no one learns from successes. They only learn from mistakes. Exactly. People, yeah, so that is it's part of it. It's half the process, more than half the process, probably 90% of the process is mistakes in photography. Um, I think in life as well, I think, just yeah. in general. Pain is a better teacher than pleasure, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think my biggest mistake was assisting for too long and not having the balls to go and take my own pictures for my own clients. I did that for far too long. That's interesting. Um, How long did you assist for? My God. Um, ten years? Maybe longer? Probably ten, ten twelve years. I loved it, I loved it, I loved assisting. I didn't dare think I could do something of my own. That's a great answer, and I'll be honest, it's not something I thought you would say. What prompted you to finally take the plunge? Because I guess you could very easily have stayed in that role and had a perfectly great career. What was the tipping point that made you suddenly think, I have to do this? I'd, I was assisting my, my, my friends I went to college with. Um, they were really high achievers in photography, in portrait photography, <laughs> oddly enough. Mm. Um, Sarah Turton and Ben Wright, who's sister, those two girls, a lot doing portraits. And just, it was easy, there's no pressure. And then I found myself thinking, why am I not doing this? Why am I not taking the pictures? Why am I not? Because I was doing the lighting a lot of the time and just lacking confidence to think when the phone rings and someone asks me to go and take a picture, I'm just going to freak out. And it happened for probably, I think it happens every time the phone rings now. Martin, could you go and photograph XYZ? And I think, oh my God, I can't do that. Even though I've done it loads of times. And sometimes I get not overwhelmed by fear, but think, oh, oh what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Even yesterday, I had to go and photograph a Olympic downhill skier, silver medalist called Chemi Alcott. Lovely girl, um, and I knew it was going to be raining. I thought, how am I going to do this? Now, outside shot, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? And then I had to stop myself, as I do nowadays, stop, physically stop moving, and remember... I've done this before, and I've always got away with it somehow. 
or made the picture happen. But it's actually literally a case of stopping and thinking, right, I need to reassure myself I can do this because I've done it before in multiple different difficult scenarios and I've pulled it off somehow. You just have to – it's like taking your stabilizers off your push bike for the first time every time. Just have to reassure yourself you can do this. And that's the process. I know how other, other photographers – who go for the same thing. Well, I'm, I'm pleased you, you mentioned it because it was going to be my question. What techniques have you developed over the years to help you deal with that feeling? Because it is, and I think it will resonate with a lot of people. Mm. Yeah, and then... When you're photographing a famous person or a celebrity... I don't care how much, how famous they are or how many followers they've got or how much cash they've got in the bank. I don't. I just strip all that away and treat them as I would the postman or, um, you know, the shopkeeper. They're just a person. They're just a face. It's a mathematical equation. Light here, shade there. They're not special. They don't get special treatment just because they're famous. I don't care how famous. I don't care who they are or what they've done. I just treat everyone with the same level of respect. And that's taken a while to do. Um, I met Barry Sheen years ago, a motorcyclist, uh, and I was a huge fan of his. And I was physically shaking because he was a mega superhero. And it's you know I used to, I used to have that with celebrities. Think oh my god they're famous. Shake, 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 shake. They're just a, they're just human being. You know you pull their skin off and they've got the same contents under there as I have and you have and everyone has. They're just the same. It's just different packaging. It's the same stuff inside. It really is. Yes. Oh, I'm going to go off on tangent just for a second. So Please, when do. I won Please that, do. When I won that Young Wildlife well Photographer of the Year, one award, I met David Attenborough, who was and still is today a superhero for me and for every single sensible person on the planet as well, I imagine. Yes, I agree. I have a photograph on, on my mobile phone of me meeting him in 1987. And I just keep that as a reminder of that's one of the things that started my career. And it's a good thing to, to go and look at now and again and remember where I started. I think it's really important to just go back, rewind, where did I start from? That's a really important thing to do for your head and your heart. And then I, why did I start doing this? And then if you, if you know the answer to that, then you can keep going. Because it's demoralising being a photographer and you're not getting work and you think, oh, no one's commissioning me, I feel worthless. Cause, and then you get depressed. And every single photographer I know suffers from depression, every single one, when they're not working. Because you don't have... If you're a photographer, you're doing something that's part of you. It's not a commute to go and sit at a desk to push a mouse around and fill in spreadsheets and come home and then your life starts. We're not like that, photographers. We are photographers. That's what we are. We're not... A job title. Anyway, so I was sat in Heathrow Airport, and there was a guy at the coffee machine. I was in the business lounge, and I was looking back at this guy's head. I thought, that looks like David Attenborough. No. And I knew it was him from the back of his head. I just knew it. And he turned around, it was, <laughs> it was him. So I went, oh, quick. So I went on my mobile phone and scrolled through 17,000 pictures to find it. And I got it on the phone, and I said, um... Mr. Hassenberg, you won't remember me, but we met. I worked out using a calculator on my phone how many years ago it was. I don't know what it was. Anyway, 1997. Um, I said, look, I met you at the National History Museum in 1997. That's you and me together. And he looked at it and he went, yes, it is. So I keep this picture on my phone because that was one of the meetings I've ever had in my life. Um, and I think you're an amazing man. At the time I said, I think you're an amazing human and that hasn't changed to this day. And he just said, thank you for keeping me close to your heart and then just walked off and I let him go then. I would have loved to have a conversation with him, but I just let him go. So, What a lovely way to respond to something though. Thank you for keeping me close to your heart. That is a yeah. lovely, lovely response. Hold on to no, that. That's what we expect. Sorry. sorry. No, no, no. Sorry. What were you going to say? Uh, yeah, well, yes, that's that is a lovely. That's David Attenborough. That's what well, that's who he is, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is right. Hold on to that thought for one moment because I'm going to try a few quick fire questions with you, and then I'm going to journey back to something related to that. So, and this is just pure gut instinct. Whatever jumps out to you, follow your heart. 
Mm. Listen to Mr. Attenborough. Black and white or colour? It's a hard question for me to answer because my dad asked me that when I was about 19, when Mm -hmm. I was wanting to be a photographer. And he destroyed my answer. He annihilated it because I thought black and white. And then he gave, he constructed this argument against black and white. So I found it, and that really destroyed my view of black and white. And I'd look black and white. He's, sorry, are you saying, asking if I could only do one, which one would I do? Um, no, I, I don't think, or well, maybe I am. I guess it's just a gut instinct. I feel like a cheat converting a colour picture to black and white. So my default is to shoot colour, and if I think it's going to look black and white, retrospectively, I'll change it to black and white, and I think I'm cheating. I, I think if you're going to shoot black and white, shoot black and white. And I if see. you're going to shoot black and white digitally, go and buy yourself a like a monochrome. Use that. Don't don't convert in a program to back to black and white because that's cheating. You're just backing up. You're building in for yourself a a safety net. Oh, it looks good in colour. I'll keep it in colour. No, shoot black and white. If you're going to shoot black and white, shoot black and white. Don't mess around shooting colour and then changing it back. That's what I would say. That's a great. Great reasoning. Possibly the best I've heard so far from that question. People or landscapes? Oh, you bugger. <laughs> These are painful questions. Oh, uh, I'm squeezing every muscle in my body. I'm going to say people. Okay. Prime or Zoom? Prime, easy. My Zoom lenses... Whatever they are, if they're 70 to 200, <laughs> I only use them at 70 or 200. <laughs> Don't do the bit in the middle. <laughs> so uh, I did have a phase of just using prime lenses and doing what I said earlier. Stick this lens on, go with that. Whatever I, whatever I have to do, do with that lens. Um, but then I just dropped them all and broke them. So I haven't got my zoom lenses back now. So. Okay. Okay. Film or Digital. Digital. Only an artist should be shooting film. Artist photographers. Mm, um, yes. Digital reproduction of digital is better. I used to say it's different. I used to say, oh, film's different. It is different, but digital is better. It's interesting because I've only ever known digital. And before I started speaking to high-profile photographers, I always felt like they preferred the film era and actually most prefer dig. They yeah, just prefer I was, it. I was a scaredy cat switching from film to digital. I had a Mimea 645. That's all I ever used to use. And I was just too scared of shooting digital, thinking, I'm losing something, I'm losing something. And what you lose is the romance. That's the bit you lose when you go to digital. There's nothing romantic yes. about digital. Nothing. If you think there is, you're kidding yourself. (laughs) Do you think you get a different... Do you think you could look at an image and tell whether it was shot on film or digital? (sighs) You good. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. I'm really cocky and say, yes... It's a bit like a champagne test, isn't it? Here's one that's tenner, and here's one that's 90 quid, and I can't when I taste it. But I will say this about film. Um, I, on the expedition I was telling you about, where we, we went, went 150 miles up the river, mm. uh, I took 30 rolls of Probia 220. So it was 30 exposures on each roll. I took 30 rolls of that, and that was it. At the start of the expedition, we spent two days at this festival, this Buddhist festival, before we set off on the expedition. I got carried away for two days. I just took nearly all the shots of the expedition on those two days. Click, 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 for two days, non-stop nearly. Going mental. Totally in love with the place. Loads of shit pictures. Wasn't really thinking. I think I got three good pictures of nearly 
20 rolls or something. And then I thought, I got my notepad out, I got the rolls film out, and I thought, right, I'll just pack away my exposed rolls film and just get all my unexposed rolls film in a different place. Oh, my God. A million miles from anywhere, I realised for the next 30 days, I could only push the button four or five times on the camera. Otherwise, I wouldn't have any film left. That's all I had every day. And so that was an average per day, an excessive day. So I could only take four or five pictures on the film. I was a little bit embarrassed. I think I had a bit of a cry, probably quite a big one in secret, thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do now? Um, so I had a 35mm camera with a couple of rolls just as a backup in case everything fell in the water. That was my backup, was two 36 rolls of 35 35 millimeter and a compact camera. So I buried the 35 millimeter film deep in my rucksack, not to be touched until I ran out of film. So, but I kept the 35 millimeter camera around my neck, and every time I pushed the button on the medium format, I had to really think about is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? <sighs> no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And then you come to the decision and you take a picture. And once I'd done five, that was it for the day. Then what I did, to satisfy the psychological, unscratchable itch of taking pictures, then I switched to the 35mm camera that didn't have any film in and took pictures that I wanted to take, knowing there was no film in the camera. So the only way I could bypass the frustration of not being able to take pictures was take them knowing there was no film in the camera. But I'd got it somehow. Mm. In my head. Whilst you prefer shooting digital do you think that way of shooting on film has molded you as a photographer because you just said something interesting then that you really have to you had to think is it worth clicking the shutter and that is something now that seems so alien because you can take a thousand images in 10 minutes if you wanted to mm. it is the complete opposite of what you've just said do you think that molded you and made you better as a photographer. Yes, it did. Because I was looking, I was looking through the camera, and I still do it now. When I'm shooting film, I used to imagine looking at a transparency on a light box. As a, you know, one I've, one I'd cut out with scissors after all film, I was looking at it on its own on a light box. Mm. That's what I was looking at through the camera. And if it didn't look like something, I wanted to see in the light box, and I wouldn't push the button. And that's what I do now. So I, th I feel really sorry for photographers who've only shot digital. I think they're missing out on part of the magic that is photography, which is taking a picture, not seeing it for days or weeks, in my case, or even a few hours, not knowing if you've got it or not, if you've got the correct exposure, then going to the lab and then handing you sheets of, sheets of glossy stuff and going over to the light box and praying that you've got what you wanted and sometimes you get nice surprises oh my god that, that's amazing i thought it was gonna be shit and opposite of that you don't have <laughs> that anymore digital all that magic all that superpower has gone somewhere yeah i mean it's so alien to people that have only ever shot on digital and actually something we, we digress slightly i was at a wedding last year and the bride and groom had very kindly put disposable cameras on each of the tables so you could take shots throughout the day and genuinely i was on the not the top table but the the next one down so to speak and i had the bride's nephews sat next to me and genuinely they were five and seven i think genuinely had no idea what this device was because and it's it suddenly made me realize wow i'm in i'm in the digital camp in photography because it's all i've ever known they are in a completely different realm they're in the phone era and the phone time and i was trying to explain to them i said well you you take it and then they said well how do we see it i said well you, you wait a couple of weeks and it seemed they they just didn't it couldn't even compute couldn't compute that they couldn't see it straight away it was incredible anyway look we digress <laughs> flash or should i say studio or natural light mm. right right yo I've, i can answer both of those i'm afraid okay please do so when i'm using flash 
I make it look like it's natural light. If it looks like flush, I'm not doing my job. Ah, okay. Because as a, as a professional photographer, you need to have the option, if there's not the kind of daylight you want to have, then you should be able to you should be able to manipulate flash to look like what you want it to look like. I think. Ian Gavin said exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. I like Ian. I like him. <laughs> He's a wonderful man. He's a wonderful photographer as well. Uh, Canon, Nikon, or other? I love my Nikon. I absolutely love my Nikon. It's um, it's actually here on my desk. It's here. I have it around. I keep it. So I keep it around. So ah, um, oh, there she is. Yeah. Um, and my my mirror camera is in the living room as a sort of on display, if I can call it that. But <laughs> <laughs> I had a for years and years and years up until 2010, actually. Up until 2010, um, I thought, when I'm a good enough photographer, I'm going to buy a Leica. Because all the best photographers that we all know and love, they've all used Leicas. Mm -hmm. But when I'm good enough, I'll buy a Leica. And then I did. I bought, I spent the same on a Leica MP that was made for me, especially made for me for an Arctic expedition. Um, I spent the same on that as I did on my Nikon D4. So whatever that was, five and a half thousand quid for a camera body, for a film camera. I'm going to make a massive contradiction now. <laughs> so I took it on an expedition with black and white film and colour transparency film. I took the black and white because I wanted to know what it felt like to be a Victorian explorer photographer taking pictures and not knowing what they were going to look like till I got back home. And I took some film to, to see what it looked like on transparency on my light box to see if there was anything more in the film than there was in the digital. And I have to say, contradicting myself now, knowingly, the film results had a certain density to them, a weight to the image that digital just didn't have. So that brought a tear to my thinking, I wish I'd taken more on my Leica than I did. And maybe that's just me being blindly romantic, I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. Perhaps, but then Alice Tomlinson, who I spoke with last week, said the very same thing, and she won the Sony Photography Awards Photographer of the Year, and oh, right. she said the light bulb moment was switching to film. And she said something very similar to what you said. It oh, just cap a... it captured something that she was missing. There was a depth to it. Yeah, but that might that depth might just be simple nostalgia. Mm, possibly. Possibly. So you know the you know the photograph of Sher pretending on top of Everett in nineteen fifty three holding his ice axe up? Yes. I've held the original transparency of that. It's at the Royal Geographic Society. I can't smile. I can't not smile when I say that. No, nor could I when you I've, said it. I've, <laughs> I've held that in my hand like that. Oh, there we go. Look at this. How romantic is that? I'm holding a flashcard. Yes. Yeah. You wouldn't throw... I just threw my flashcard onto the floor. You wouldn't do that with a piece of film because it's precious and it's been, that piece of film has been to the top of Everest. And I'm holding that in my hand. I'm holding a piece of history in my hand when you hold a negative or transparency. No matter what point of history it is, yesterday or 1953, you can hold history in your hand with film. You can't do that with a 16 megabyte, what is it? 10 by 10 something, whatever it is, UDMA 7, don't know what it is. That's... <laughs> yeah. You can't put history, can you? I mean, it's all in there somewhere, but it's not really assembled in a format that's history, is it? No, that that makes a lot of sense. Because it's the story behind it then. And like you say, it's the history behind it. Speaking of Everest, 
home or abroad? And I don't necessarily mean in terms of work. It can be work, obviously, but... My God, that's a, that's a bomb question. Um, uh, away. May I ask why? Hmm. Well, because I'm greedy. That's why. Because I want to see what is out there on the planet. And there's some amazing, beautiful pockets. I have had some of the best experiences I've ever had. In fact, last year I went to photograph a friend of mine's wedding, Eldo Kane, up in Scotland. At the end of it, uh, I thought I'd take my tent and go and camp somewhere on my own on top of the mountain. And it's miserable weather. I was camping, put the tent up, felt a bit lonely, felt a bit sad, felt a bit alone. Um, and stopped raining and I sat in my tent looking out at the most incredible, beautiful Scottish mountain scene with clouds coming and going. And there was a, there was a stag in the valley below making this incredible roaring sound and there was a raven <laughs> flying overhead and it was... N- not a stag do, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you never know in Scotland. Yeah, and I thought, oh my God, I'm having the time of my life and it hasn't cost me a penny and I'm here. It's brilliant. Couldn't Life could not be better. But then I think, oh, I want to go, I want to go and see big mountains. I want to go and see massive sea ice Escapes. I want to see deserts. I want to meet people who have, would never meet in the UK. I want to taste their food and smell the smells you have when you're walking around um, a bazaar in Oman. Or just want to meet people with different ways of thinking, different ways of living and being and believing. You can't, that richness is all out there. There's plenty of richness here in the UK, but culturally, I want to go and taste everything, as it were. Yeah. And I don't think it's greedy at all. Life is life is precious and life is short and you no one knows what's around the corner, so you've got to do you've got to follow your heart and you've got to do what makes you happy. Yeah. Which takes me on rather beautifully, romantically, poetically, however you want to look at it, to if you could journey back to nineteen eighty seven that 15-year-old stood next to David Attenborough at the National History Museum. What advice would you give to that young man? Oh, I've had this question before. I can't say it without having a tear in my eye, um, but I'll try. Um, um, I would say, tell your mum you love her more often. Phone him more often. Tell your daddy proud of him, not the other way around, expecting him to say it when he won't. I would say, tell people what you think, not what you think they want to hear. And whatever they think about you, it does not matter, as long as you're not being horrible. Don't care what people think. That's really important, I think. I spent my entire youth and a lot of my adult life worrying what people thought about me and trying to make them trying to please them just because i wanted everyone to like me it's not important for people to like you that is a huge mistake i made um and if you really want to do something absolutely nothing is going to stop you doing it apart from yourself that is if you want to be a formula one racing driver start looking into ways of going on track days and jumping in boring cars and just do it. Just find, just ask people. People will always help you on your way. So ask for help. That's the other thing I've learned late in life is not asking for help soon enough. That's what I would say. Crikey, I don't know whether, I don't know about you having a tear in your eye. You you nearly got me. You really nearly got me then, particularly talking about parents and mums and dads. And very different to timothy allen's answer who i spoke to last week who said in 2019 buy a lot of bitcoin 
and then you can make as many fo- films and photographs and travel the world as much as you wish. <laughs> so very different <laughs> indeed. Thank you. Martin Hartley, I cannot thank you enough for this conversation. Thank you ever so much for joining me on the Standout Photography Show. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this. Some very, very philosophical, interesting and important questions. I'm very thankful to be have this conversation. I don't think it's an interview, it's a conversation, so thank you. Good. The pleasure has been all mine. Now, if no, people... No, I'll, take, I'll take half of that. <laughs> okay, deal. We'll go down the middle, 50-50. Now, if people want to find more about you and see your work, where can they go? martinhartley.com or um, I actually prefer to point people towards my Instagram, which is at Martin R. Hartley. Because uh, Instagram has got a bit more personality because I've written some captions there, and I think it's important for photographers to learn to write about their work because that's half of the photograph is the caption. That's it. Yeah, funnily enough, Chris Weston said earlier when I spoke to him that you should always think before clicking the shutter what is the caption. And I thought it was quite an interesting concept that I'd not really thought of. And his example was, he said, if, if for example, you, you are taking a photograph of a bird, is uh, and the bird, you, you get one shot of the bird on its own, and then there's a shot of the bird singing. The shot of the bird singing is far more interesting and easier to caption. Oh. I said, well, I've got you. Mm. On that point of the caption, if I may ask you a question. Please do. Do you remember years ago there was the World Press Photo Awards? There was a, f- a winning the photograph that won the award that year was of a tiny, skinny, little child crunched upon the floor, alive, and in the background was a, was a vulture. Do you remember that picture? I don't, but I have Google in front of me. So have a look at that, and that picture appeared with a caption. I don't know what the caption was. But the photographer was interviewed on the radio um, about his award and that picture. And then there was questions and answers at the end of the interview. And someone radio called into the radio station and said, what happened after that picture was taken? Did the child survive? And the photographer said in the interview, I don't know. I had to capture the plane it wasn't in the caption what happened afterwards um very very sadly i can't remember the name of the photographer i'm ashamed myself after that interview and he said he had to go and catch a plane then he got vitriol poured all over him and i'm pretty sure if memory serves me correctly he ended up committing suicide if that information was in the caption that the child survived or didn't that person wouldn't have called in and asked him and he wouldn't have had to answer that name and answer that question. He probably would have been alive. That is the best example of importance of a caption I can think of with a picture. I completely, completely agree. So what, what year was it, do you know? Or, or what, what, which award was it? It was um, World Press Photo Award. Um, World Press Photo and I, I made that point because I had... A discussion at the Travel Photographer of the Year Award, which was held at the Royal Geographic Society a year ago. I was chatting with this guy, a complete stranger, who was who just made some comment to me that I don't know why they bother with captions. They're not important. It's a photography exhibition. Why have we got these captions? So I was as polite as I could <laughs> um, about trying to explain to him why it is important to have <laughs> we have captions. But I didn't know the anecdote at the time, but I think that is the best example I can think of about why caption's important. 
That was the final part of my conversation with the wonderful, delightful Mr. Martin Hartley. I cannot thank Martin enough for A, speaking with me, but B, being so gracious and generous with his time that I was able to create the very first two-part interview on the Standout Photography Show. As always, if you are enjoying the show, please support it with your words, not your wallets. This show is completely free, and that's how it will always remain. It takes less than 30 seconds to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening right now, but... It makes a huge difference securing the highest achieving photographers with very busy schedules. We also have a brand new feature here on the Standout Photography Show, Answers for the Audience. So if you have a question for one of our photographers, you can call us and leave your question and we will feature it on an upcoming episode. So if you have a question, you can give us a call on 0207. 459-4295. Four five nine four two nine five. Once again, that is O two O seven four five nine four two nine five. Leave a message and we will feature your question on the show very shortly. Until next time, thank you as always for tuning in. I've been Matthew Walker. He has been Martin Hartley, and you, as always, have been sensational. Until next time, take care. 